Hello, I'm Peter Rowland. And I'm Katie Steckles. And what's today's mathematical object? Well, today I have brought my Towers Have an Eye puzzle, which I bought cheap in a shop once, and I see on the box it's called Wooden Strategy Puzzle, which does not uniquely define it as an object. <laughs> but anyway, Towers of Hanoi, you may well be familiar with. It's three, well, any number of pegs, but typically three pegs, and any number of discs. And the one I've got here has, I think, eight discs. And the... The discs are getting smaller as they go up the stack, and the idea is you've got to move them from one peg to another with the condition that you never put a bigger disc on top of a smaller one. Yeah, so this is like an ancient historical thing, right? It's a a very long-established puzzle. I think it has history in the 1800s in France. I'm yeah. not sure. Oh, but they, they've associated it with a much older mm. thing, so it's named after presumably some actual towers. Yes, so there's a story which you see various different versions of, and in some of those stories it's a temple in Hanoi, hence it's called the Towers of Hanoi puzzle, um, in which there are 64 discs and the priests or monks, whatever um, reading you're doing of it, have to move these discs from one needle to another in such a way that at no stage may a larger disc rest on top of a smaller one, and they have to uh, transfer the whole pile to the second, a second needle, at which point the world will end. Right. So, you know, it has its well, roots in theori- theoretical physics. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit worrying, isn't it? That, Absolutely. That, you know, when they finish doing this, which presumably they'll just, you know, they'll rattle through it. Pretty quickly, you'd yeah. think. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, so, so are they meant to be stone discs in the in the Well, sometimes they're gold temple. and sometimes okay. they're other things. Because just imagining 64 differently sized things, the biggest one is going to be quite mm. big. I don't know. That's true, actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you carry yeah. on the stack we've got here, so the smallest one's about two centimetres across, the biggest one is about maybe five. But mm. if you carried that on, yeah, yeah. that's a tiring effort, yeah. especially moving it back and forth. Presumably only a few times. Oh, I yeah, guess. Well, yeah, once or twice. Yeah. Well, true. the biggest one actually, you do only move once, right? That's, that's the true. Thing that's about true. This. You can only. So, yeah. uh, th- what's quite nice about this puzzle is it, it it opens itself up quite nicely to there's a standard problem solving technique, which is try and solve a simpler case of this problem. If I just had one disc and I wanted to move it to a different peg, I would pick it up and put it on the different peg. Yeah. So the solution for one disc is one move. Um, in all these things, you talk about the optimal solution because, of course, you could send it back and forth quite a bit and get confused and all that. Um, in a way, you could you could try doing it with two. With two, I have the starting peg and I have the target peg that I want to get to, but I can't put the smallest one straight away onto the target peg because then I can't put the bigger one on top of it. Yeah. So what I do is I put the smallest one on the third peg, on the sort of spare peg, then I move the one, the biggest one, the second one, across, and then I move the little one again to be on top of it. Yeah. And that's it for three. Yeah, so I guess you could move the smallest one straight to the target peg, but then you'd have to put the bigger one onto the other peg, move the smaller one somewhere else, and then put the bigger one on the yeah. target peg. So it would be an inefficient way of doing it. Would it would introduce yeah. an extra step that you yeah. don't need, absolutely. So if I were to do it with three pegs, the thing that you start to notice here is... With three, what I need to do is I need to move the two out of the way and then move the biggest one onto the target peg and then move the two on top of it. Yeah, the two smaller ones need to be somewhere else so that you can move the third one. Absolutely. And the way to move them somewhere else optimally is the solution to the two-ring version of the problem. Okay, except now you don't do it so that you're finishing on the target peg, you do it so you're finishing on the other peg. Yes. And then the target peg is clear. Okay, yeah, so it's... Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, using those rules, I move the two version of the game, then I move the extra peg, then I move the two version of the game. Yeah, this is reminding me of the classic sort of reducing it to a problem we've already solved, kind of Absolutely. proof by induction thing, where you, I mean, it, I mean, he's just cheated. Like, if, if you could see what was happening here, he's just <laughs> moved the two pieces at the same time, which is a very mathematician way of saying, mm. I know how to make these two pieces be wherever I want to. It will take me a couple of moves, but it's a problem I already know the answer to, so I'm just going to move them together. Absolutely. Which is very much cheating, mm. but I know why you did that. So if I was solving it for the eight, I would simply move the seven, <laughs> which I know how to do, then move the one, then move yeah. the seven again. And, and yeah. if you, you don't really want to listen to me clicking through that with all these... Um, yeah. yeah, there's some good sound effects in this one, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so what we're talking about there is a recurrence relation, 
So to do n rings, let's imagine I have n rings here, I must first move n minus one of them onto the spare peg, then I move the nth one itself, mm -hmm. and then I move the n minus one of them again. Yeah, as long as you have a method for moving n minus one things using only two pegs, yes. which you always have, because that's the yes. two spare you, pegs. You yeah. have to convince yourself that that's always possible. Yeah. Um, there, there are sort of algorithms you can go through for solving this thing where um, basically you move, you just keep making the only available move in certain circumstances. Or there's there's one where you consider the three pegs to be in a clockwork arrangement, a uh, clockwork, arrangement, and you move just keep moving everything clockwise. Mm -hmm. There are various ways that you can you can sort of convince yourself that that's always possible. Um, so yeah, this uh, the recurrence relation then says the Hanoi number for n rings is the Hanoi number for n minus one rings plus the nth ring, which is one move, plus the Hanoi number for n minus one rings again. To move them all back again. To move them all back <laughs> yeah. on top. So you end up with twice the previous step plus one. Okay. At each That's step. a nice recurrence relation. Mm. And then by a bit of fiddling about, um, you can, well, one thing you can do is do this for a bunch and you happen to notice that they're all one less than a power of two. Right. So that gives you a, a guess that the Hanoi number for n might be 2 to the n minus 1, as in 1 less than 2 to the n. Yeah, which makes sense because 2 times 2 to the n minus 1 is 2 to the n. So that kind of works, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, well, you prove that by induction, which yeah. is not worth doing in audio, Yeah. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Do it on a blackboard for your homework. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a nice little little um, gimmick, really. It gets you into recurrence relations. It, like I say, it gets you into that, that thing of solving a puzzle by splitting it down to an easier case, because if you say, how do you do it for eight rings? Well, you just sit there for ages, clicking away at it. But you don't have to do it for very long before you convince yourself that you're just what you're doing is a recursive pattern. Yeah. Because to do it for eight, I would first move one, then I would move the second one, then I would move the third one and move the two on top of that, then I would move the fourth one and move the three on top of that. And you, you can sort of see that it builds up. Actually, there are some really nice results. If you um, There's a way of considering this puzzle to be like a graph of possible moves. And because it's got this recursive structure, you end up producing little triangles if there are three pegs. And then you have three little triangles, and then you have three copies of that, right. and then you have like three copies of that, thing. and you end yeah. up with a, um, yes, is that Sapinski Was it Sapinski triangle? Yes. You end That's up with the triangle, triangle is fractal, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, the one thing then to come back to is the original puzzle, the how long is the Earth going to exist. Uh, because there are 64 rings there, we know that solving 64 rings is 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, and uh, that's quite a big number. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's quite a big number minus one, yes. which is a slight, you know, makes it feel slightly better. Slightly but smaller than, it's, than yeah, quite it's a still, big number, yes. Given, you know, assuming maybe 30 seconds to move a ring from <laughs> thing to another thing, <laughs> well, that's generous. the common reading that you get, I'm looking at, um, Robin Wilson has this very good book, Combinatorics, A Very Short Introduction, and there he suggests that you can do each ring in a second. Which, as you say, your sixty-fourth ring might be pretty big yeah. for, to move in a second. But assuming you can move each, make each move in one second, then transferring all sixty-four discs will take about five hundred eighty-five billion years. Okay, so we're we're safe for a while. We're pretty yeah. safe for a while. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's a lovely little puzzle. There's lots of nice sort of patterns in. Um, I remember there's a link between which of the n rings you move on each turn and. Something like the the pattern of the right hand digit in binary numbers, or oh, something. Okay. There's all because it's always mm. it, every other move you move the smallest one. Mm. I think it's the thing, and in binary, every other number has a one in the ones digit because yeah. it's the odd numbers. That makes sense. Um, and it's I think it's also as Martin Gardner was was sort of equating all these things. There's something to do with traversing a dodecahedron or some kind of three D traverse of traversing okay. an n dimensional cube. I think it was. Um, you, yeah, there are three dimensions you can move in in 3D okay. and if you traverse the whole thing there is a nice traverse that you do where every other tra every other move is made in the X dimension mm -hmm. and then every other other move is made in the Y dimension and it's the same pattern as which piece you move in three t three piece Hanoi yeah. um, and for an N dimensional cube the N dimensions represent the N pieces of the tower mm. um, and then it's also that, that, that sounds like a reworking yeah. of the, the Sapinski graph that I'm I guess yeah, yeah, the, yeah this is all connected maths, yeah. is, maths is brilliant <laughs> yes. um, and I think it's also if you look at a ruler up to a certain level mm. the, the length of the notch is like the biggest notch 
and the the smallest notch is every other notch right. and then every fourth notch is the second smallest you know the kind of the little lines on the edge of the ruler yeah. if anyone's got a ruler nearby look at it now and go oh yeah <laughs> um but it's there's all these different patterns that follow the same kind of structure which is really nice mm. that's good okay well uh we've been uh katie steckles at stex on twitter peter ollett at peter ollett on twitter um, and if you want to uh, get in touch with us, if you've got any thoughts or any questions about what we've talked about or any suggestions for mathematical objects we could talk about in future episodes, uh, you can email objects at aperiodical.com. The music is Funk Game Loop by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons.